Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. We have a very interesting product in the labs for review today. These sorts of things don't come around too often, so I'm super excited to get into the results. Basically, Corsair have made their first monitor, which they are announcing today, right now in fact. But this isn't just a quiet launch where Corsair send their monitor out to store shelves and hope some people notice. No, Corsair actually have some confidence in their product, which is good to see. They've sent out the monitor ahead of time to us and several other reviewers to comprehensively evaluate it alongside the launch. So in this video, we'll be able to tell you whether Corsair's first monitor is actually any good or not. It's called the Xenion 32QHD165. Not 100% sure how to pronounce Xenion, and Corsair didn't seem to fully know either when I asked, they suggested maybe Xenion, but I think for this video I'm going to stick with Xenion. And the letters and number suit that follows is both simple to understand, but also somehow too long, 32 QHD 165. This indicates we're looking at a 32 inch monitor with a QHD resolution, aka 1440p, and a 165 hertz maximum refresh rate. No cryptographic name decoder required, though it is still a bit of a mouthful. 32 inch mid to high refresh 1440p monitors have really accelerated as a product category this year with the introduction of quality IPS panels. And that's exactly what Corsair are using in their first display. So it's large, it's flat, and Corsair are quoting 100% Adobe RGB coverage in addition to 98% DCI-P3 thanks to quantum dot enhancement. On the refresh rate side of things, obviously it tops out at 165Hz, but it's also variable refresh compatible with AMD FreeSync Premium certification and NVIDIA G-Sync compatible. Corsair are gunning straight for the high end of the market with a price tag of $800, US which puts it on par with the ASUS ROG Swift PG329Q, although locally in Australia the Corsair monitor should be about $80 cheaper. Let's hope their execution is up to scratch to match that price point, always a tall order when you're a newcomer, but I'm not going to write them off just yet. Today's video sponsor is Be Quiet and their brand new Pure Power 11 FM, available in 550, 650 and 750 watt capacities and with an 80 plus gold rating. As you'd expect from Be Quiet, these are exceptionally quiet power supplies with almost inaudible operation, but they're not shy when it comes to power delivery. And in fact, the Pure Power 11 FM is more than just a Pure Power 11 with all modular cables. Rather, it's based on a better topology, featuring a half bridge and LLC circuit, making it almost on par with the higher rated Straight Power 11 series. It's also backed by a five year warranty. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. The design used here is both unique and not unique, if you know what I mean. We have the top section, which is fairly standard. You probably would have seen something like that before, but also this bottom stand section, which is a design, yeah, I guess I've never really seen before. It's actually quite hard to describe what's going on with the base of the stand. There's a large elevated loop setup and also two small backwards facing legs for stability. Lots going on here, and while only the front bar section and the two small legs actually contact your desk, it's really quite a massive base, all things considered. It takes up a huge footprint relative to what I've seen on other 32-inch monitors. From that perspective, I'm not that much of a fan. However, Corsair are using premium materials here, not just for the base, but also the stand pillar, which are majority metal, and it's a really nice smooth finish to the metal. It makes the stand extremely sturdy with very little wobble, despite supporting height, tilt and swivel adjustment and a good range of motion in all those areas. The top section that houses the monitor is made of plastic though, so not everything has received that premium touch. With that said, Corsair has gone with a very simple design for the rear, which I actually really like. No stupid gamer patterns, no bulging thick rear casing to accommodate pointless features, just a clean black aesthetic and a reasonably slim panel housing. Corsair's choice to make most of this section out of a single piece of plastic has worked very well. Then on the front you have the typical bezel sizes with a small Corsair logo. Much to my surprise, Corsair haven't included any RGB LED lighting. On their peripherals and everything from all-in-one liquid coolers to RAM, they love to include RGB LEDs, which in most cases I've found to be rather pointless on a monitor. I'm glad Corsair have resisted the urge to include RGB here, aside from the display panel itself, and is sticking to offering lighting on stuff where it's more useful. For ports, we have two HDMI 2.0 and one DisplayPort 1.4, along with USB Type-C that operates in DP Alt mode. Little disappointing that the HDMI ports are only 2.0, as that limits them to 144Hz. HDMI 2.1 would have alleviated this issue and allowed for the full 165Hz, in line with what the DisplayPorts can do. There's also some USB outputs and an audio jack. 
As for the OSD, it's controlled through a directional toggle on the rear of the display. Very basic setup here, and I think this is one area where it's most indicative of being Corsair's first ever monitor. Yes, we do get various color controls and even a refresh rate display, as well as an sRGB mode and backlight strobing, but it's missing some of the other gamer features that buyers of high-end ASUS and Gigabyte monitors have been enjoying, stuff like cheat crosshairs, shadow boosters, KVM switches, and so on. Not a huge deal, but the feature set is pretty light on. With that said, Corsair have integrated the 32QHD165 with their existing product line and IQ software, so you can control these OST features through peripherals like the Stream Deck. So that's pretty neat. It also supports optional accessories like the Elgato Flex Arm, and that can be screwed into the top of the stand for mounting, say, a stream camera. Of course, I was particularly interested to see how Corsair would handle motion performance on their very first gaming monitor, so let's take a look at that now. Just the three overdrive settings in the OSD, and the first of them is the normal mode, which is a classic overdrive off experience with minimal overshoot and middling response times around the 10 millisecond mark. This actually isn't too bad for default performance, so that suggests Corsair are using a decent panel here, but performance obviously could be improved. The fast mode at 165Hz is a small improvement on the normal mode. The average response time has decreased to 8.60 milliseconds, so a little over a 1 millisecond improvement, and that's caused a small improvement to cumulative deviation as well. This has been achieved without impacting overshoot, though in general the speed exhibited here isn't fast enough for 165Hz gaming. Then we have the fastest mode, which is the best mode for gaming at the highest refresh rate, as indicated by the lowest cumulative deviation figure we've seen so far. This mode pushes us into overshoot territory, and seeing 40% of transitions with noticeable inverse ghosting isn't the best result. However, the actual amount of overshoot is low, so the level to which inverse ghosting is visible is quite limited, and really you're just swapping out the blur trail from the prior fast mode with a slight bright trail in the fastest mode. Overall, I think the motion clarity is somewhat better in the fastest mode, though of course some may prefer the no overshoot experience of fast. In terms of response time average, 4.26 milliseconds is decent and a clear improvement, so overshoot is only one part of the story. Corsair claims a sub 3 millisecond grade to grade average in their spec sheet, and this isn't quite met with our new strict response time testing method, but interestingly, this mode recorded in at 2.99 milliseconds using our older and more traditional method. So Corsair are being reasonably accurate on the spec sheet, which is a nice change from most monitors that just throw in 1 milliseconds on there without thinking. They can actually achieve a 3 millisecond average response in reasonable test conditions. While the fastest mode is the best for 165Hz gaming in my opinion, it's not the best mode for gaming across the refresh range with adaptive sync variable refresh rates. The lack of variable overdrive hurts the 32QHD165 here, as at 144Hz and especially at 120Hz, the fastest mode simply has too much overshoot and now inverse ghosting trails are very noticeable. So really the fastest mode is only suitable for locked 165Hz gaming, which you might get in sort of an eSports type title. The best mode for adaptive sync is the fast mode, which keeps response times in control while limiting overshoot to negligible levels, even down at 60Hz. For the most part, cumulative deviation remains around 600, which isn't too bad. However, it's clearly a fair bit slower than the fastest mode in the best cases, so ideally I'd have liked to see a mode between fast and fastest that could have offered a more optimized experience. Either that or a full overdrive slider that could have provided fine tuning. The results here aren't the worst, but unfortunately the Xenion 32QHD165 does not have a single overdrive mode experience, which is a frustrating omission for a high-end monitor. More overdrive modes or variable overdrive would be required here to achieve the best single overdrive mode gaming. As it stands, most adaptive sync gamers should choose the fast mode, while those playing at 165Hz should use fastest. Compared to other monitors, the 32QHD165 is sitting right where it should be in the best conditions at the highest refresh rate, in among other high-end IPS monitors which deliver between a 4 and 4.7 millisecond response time average. Unfortunately though, the Corsair offering has the highest overshoot of the bunch by far, so there's clearly some room for optimization here. Competing monitors such as the Gigabyte M32Q and ASUS ROG Swift PG329Q have lower overshoot at a similar response time average, while the LG32 GP850 backs off even further to reduce overshoot. So from that sense, this monitor perhaps isn't as strong as its position in the chart would suggest. 
Due to the limited range of overdrive controls, the 32QHD165 is not particularly amazing on average across the refresh range, with settings optimized for variable refresh rate gaming. The fast mode doesn't have much overshoot, but it's quite a bit slower than the faster mode, and that hurts the Corsair monitors standing in the chart. For example, the PG329Q is able to offer nearly 50% faster response times on average, with only a small increase to overshoot, as it includes variable overdrive while the Corsair monitor does not. That's how key those sorts of inclusions can be for high-end products, and unfortunately the Xenion is missing out. However, on the balance of things, the 32QHD165 still has pretty good response time performance, and that's indicated by cumulative deviation results. This metric tells us how close each monitor's response curves get to the ideal instant response, and it quantifies the balance between response times and overshoot. Across the adaptive sync range, the 32QHD165 being a low overshoot monitor helps in this chart, and overall it's only slightly worse than other similar high-end displays. For example, the gap between the Corsair monitor and the ASUS equivalent drops to 19% in favour of the ASUS model. So yeah, the PG329Q is still better, but it's not that much better, and the difference is even smaller to a product like the 32GP850. Of course, I'd like to see this number optimised further through things like variable overdrive and more overdrive controls on a future Corsair monitor, but they're clearly using quite a good panel on the 32QHD165, and that leads to OK motion performance. At 120Hz, the Corsair monitor is not particularly impressive, and this is really where it suffers the most in comparison to other high-end displays of similar specs. Better overdrive tuning would have led to a better result here. Then for 60Hz, this performance is quite important, as the Xenion does include a console mode that accepts 4K 60Hz inputs and downscales them to 1440p. The low level of overshoot is nice, but performance is still somewhat below other monitors of a similar spec, like the M32Q. Input lag is strong, the 32QHD165 has a processing delay below 1 millisecond, so that's a non-issue, and the only other thing with a major impact on latency is the refresh rate. 240Hz monitors are also available at a similar price, and due to their higher refresh rate, they do have lower latency. The Corsair monitor has similar efficiency to a product like the ASUS PG329Q, which makes sense as I believe both use an AU Optronics panel. However, this panel is not the most efficient on the market, with lower power consumption figures seen from monitors such as the LG 32GP850 and Gigabyte M32Q. Not a big deal in the grand scheme of things though. I'm pleased to see the Xenion include backlight strobing support, though it's limited in its functionality. Corsair only supports this mode with FreeSync disabled, in contrast to a product like the Gigabyte M32Q that now supports backlight strobing and adaptive sync simultaneously. I did get the feature working as low as 100Hz, but 60Hz strobing is not possible. There's also no fine tuning possible for strobe timing or length, it's just an on off switch. Despite all of that, backlight strobing actually works pretty well. The fact this panel uses quantum dot enhancement instead of a KSF backlight is a big boost for strobing clarity. No red fringing seen here. There is a faint double image as the panel's response times aren't quite fast enough to keep up at 165Hz, but overall clarity in this mode is better than the M32Q, much better than the 32GP850, and very similar to the PG329Q. It's worth experimenting with this mode, particularly for fixed 165Hz refresh gaming in competitive titles, though the lack of compatibility with variable refresh rates isn't going to make it a go-to choice for everyone. Next up we have color performance, and as advertised, the 32QHD165 is an extremely wide gamut display. I recorded 95% DCI-P3 coverage, so a little shy of the advertised 98%, but I was able to validate 100% Adobe RGB coverage. The high coverage of three gamuts, including sRGB as well, makes this an extremely versatile display for content creation, with total Rec 2020 coverage of 83% right up there with the best monitors on the market today. You're getting a full 20 percentage point increase on gamut coverage over a product like the M32Q, which is massive. The out-of-the-box experience is pretty standard. Corsair have opted for flat 2.2 gamma instead of sRGB gamma, which is fine but not accurate for PC usage as Windows defaults to using sRGB. My unit also had a slight red tint from the factory. Grayscale Delta E performance was pretty average as a result, but not terrible. 
The bigger issue for factory calibration is more the extremely wide gamut which is left unchecked by default. This leads to high levels of oversaturation when viewing standard sRGB or Rec. 709 content such as YouTube videos. This level of wide gamut commonly leads to the sunburn skin effect where pinky brown tones are shifted into the red zone. So in comparison to other displays, the 32QHD165 is mid-tier for grayscale calibration, nothing too wrong here, but color accuracy is very bad straight out of the box and I would not recommend people use the display in that way. Luckily, Corsair do include an sRGB mode, so that's a tick for their first ever monitor. I'm very glad to see they've realized that they need to do something about the huge gamut on offer. And the mode is very effective at clamping the gamut and completely eliminating oversaturation for everyday content. Unfortunately though, grayscale performance is pretty similar to the default mode and Corsair locks you out of any white balance controls, which is pointless and annoying. The only way to improve performance from here is to fully calibrate the display, which we did with Calman Ultimate in this case. Because it has no issue covering the entire sRGB gamut, it's very easy to calibrate and get good results for sRGB, and even other color spaces like Adobe RGB or DCI-P3. In fact, calibration is basically required for Adobe RGB and DCI-P3 as the gamut exceeds both of those in the default mode, and of course they don't offer built-in modes for those gamuts like they do for sRGB. That's another area of improvement, though I would expect most pro or semi-pro users to calibrate it themselves anyway. Brightness is right on what Corsair says at a touch over 400 nits, so that's plenty bright for most use cases and slightly brighter than most of its competitors. Minimum brightness is also great at 40 nits, so the panel can comfortably be used in dark rooms. The contrast ratio is pretty good for an IPS monitor. My unit recorded over 1100 to 1, which I suspect will be on the high end once panel variance is taken into account. Still, that's on par with the Gigabyte M32Q and better than other competitors like the 32GP850 and PG329Q, which both have poor contrast ratios for an IPS. However, IPS panels in general have bad contrast ratios, especially compared to VA monitors, so I guess this is really still a weakness. Viewing angles are good, a non-issue when buying most modern IPS displays. Uniformity was also average to good, the center section was pretty uniform all things considered with some fall off along the left and right edges. Nothing too concerning though, and in a positive note my unit had limited IPS glow, though of course this does vary from unit to unit. Lastly, just a quick word on HDR performance. Coursera advertising display HDR 400 certification, however this is a garbage spec that doesn't mean anything. In practice, the 32QHD165 lacks any form of local dimming, so it cannot produce the level of contrast required for true HDR. The monitor does accept HDR inputs, but in practice the HDR experience is like running the monitor in the SDR mode with the brightness turned up. Because it's physically incapable of high contrast ratios, I don't think the 32QHD165 should be thought of as an HDR monitor at all. Overall, for a first attempt at a gaming monitor, or really any monitor at all for that matter, the Corsair Xenion 32QHD165 isn't too bad. Surprisingly good even. I don't know whether this was an in-house design or whether Corsair relied on an ODM to do the heavy lifting, but the results are immediately competitive with today's displays of a similar spec. This is a far cry from the rubbish Razer Raptor 27 we just looked at, which failed to provide anywhere near acceptable performance, and that was Razer's second attempt. Motion performance is usually the hardest thing to get right, and this monitor does an okay to good job here depending on the circumstances. Overall, it's pretty competitive with high-end IPS monitors of today, slightly behind in metrics like cumulative deviation, but it's pretty fast at 165Hz. It also has great though limited backlight strobing. The main issue here are the features around the edge that can lift a monitor from good to great performance like variable overdrive, more overdrive modes, or a single overdrive mode experience. The 32QHD165 isn't at the level of a high-end monitor in these areas, but you're not left with a blurry gaming experience either. Color performance is quite strong with an exceptionally wide gamut that makes this display quite versatile as a dual gaming and productivity monitor. Top end coverage of sRGB, P3 and Adobe RGB covers most of the important stuff and Corsair complements this with a usable sRGB mode to prevent massive oversaturation for everyday use. Yeah, I could nitpick a few things about calibration and so on, but it's a great looking display with decent IPS contrast, strong brightness and respectable uniformity. Where Corsair is a bit lacking is on the feature side. Some people will miss things like shadow boosting modes or a KVM switch that you do get with other displays, or stuff like backlight strobing and variable refresh rate simultaneously. 
The design could probably use some optimization as well, but the bare bones are there for a monitor that's quite good at gaming, video playback, and productivity. While the 32QHD165 isn't too bad from a hardware perspective, there are two other things that will probably hold you back from making an immediate purchase. The big one is the price tag. $800 is too much for this monitor, and I think Corsair were being pretty optimistic if they thought they could compete with the established ASUS PG329Q. The PG329Q is a very strong performer with better tuning and superior features, and for similar money, it's what I'd buy. Corsair are also running into the issue of competing with other product categories. You can get some really good 1440p 240Hz displays at this price tag. Yeah, they are mostly going to be 27-inch models outside of the Odyssey G7, but they're faster and more future-proof. There's also several 4K 144Hz options these days for $800 or less. Again, they'll be a smaller panel size, but it's another category I'd strongly be considering. On the other hand, I think the 32QHD165 is better than the Gigabyte M32Q and LG 32GP850, or at least they're highly competitive with those models, and they typically retail for between $400 and $500. The Corsair model provides slightly slower response to performance, but much better color performance and clearer backlight strobing. I think Corsair could get away with a higher price than those models, something around $500 to $600, and that's pretty good for a first attempt. It is, however, at least a $200 price reduction on the current MSRP, so from that perspective, I could only recommend this display at a discount. The other issue, being a first attempt at a product category, are concerns around warranty and support. Corsair are mitigating this to some extent with a three-year warranty, which is on the better end for gaming displays, and their dead pixel policy is okay. But there's always going to be some risk there versus a more established brand with a history of making high-quality monitors. I don't often make note of warranty type issues in my reviews, but on this occasion, I could see people avoiding the first ever product from Corsair on this basis, and really, we won't know how this will play out for some time. So again, perhaps Corsair going all out on pricing, trying to make it compete at $800 wasn't the best situation considering all those factors. Anyway, that's it for this review of Corsair's first ever gaming monitor. Like I said, I don't think it's too bad. There's certainly some things that Corsair should work on. Adding a few more features in here would make them compete more strongly at the high end, but at an appropriate price, I think this monitor is worth considering, and that's pretty impressive from a first ever monitor from a company. If you're interested in supporting our monitor testing, we do have our Patreon and Floatplane accounts. Links are in the description to those. You'll be able to sign up and get access to things like early video access for some videos, not this video, it was an NDA video, but some other videos if you sign up to Floatplane. Uh, we've got our Discord community, we've got behind the scenes videos, all that good stuff. So thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.